confiscated African men from Portuguese and other vessels on the high sea. So the first 11 black men were brought here in 1625 and 26 for the purpose, again, of helping to build or helping to build a wall, uh, because Wall Street was initially a wall, and to the fortifications of early New Amsterdam. Um, three years later, uh, five women were brought here to clean the houses of the Dutch women who lived here. And according to the local priest, uh, these women weren't good house cleaners, or certainly they weren't up to the standards of the Dutch women. However, all of these women were married multiple times, even the oldest one, because uh, they, there was a greater ratio of black men here to black women for quite some time. Uh, let's go to the next slide. African men, women, and children were a part of the builders of early New York. Uh, we know from the excavation of the 19, uh, of the 1991-92 African burial ground that 45% of the remains from the burial ground were the remains of children under 12, which is an indicator of what kind of life the children led in terms of disease and poverty. Uh, next slide, please. Slavery always was a business, and anyone who denies that or says slavery wasn't profitable is totally mistaken. This is one of the advertisements from the early British period, uh, I'm sorry, from the late British period, in terms of people being sold, uh, to be sold, the subscriber having broke up housekeeping for the present, has for sale a Negro man and a Negro woman with her child of about two years old. The Negro man and his wife will be sold together or separate, as may suit the purchaser. They both understand housework, and the Negro man has been used to assist in the callow Cannery business, basically candle making. Inquire of the price of Abraham Van Dersen at number 10 Dock Street. According to public records, Abraham Van Dersen was a slave trader. That was his occupation. Again, in this very profitable business of buying and selling human beings. Uh, most often when you see for sale ads, they are for individuals. But in New York, it's clearly documented that slave owners and people in this business had absolutely no hesitation to break up African families for the purpose of the purchaser. Uh, and there are at least a dozen advertisements like this where you're being told flat out that the purchaser may break up the family if they so desire. Uh, quite often people did not want to buy women with children because it was thought that taking care of your own child would actually diminish your ability to take care of possibly their children or clean their houses or work for the quote master. Next slide, please. This is an image from New Amsterdam, 1642. Uh, it was circulated throughout Europe to entice other Europeans to the great wilderness known as Manhattan Island. Um, and the, the message here is that uh, you, there's a busy uh, backdrop of a busy seaport. I think the next slide is sort of a larger image. And uh, the Africans are viewed as a part of the bounty of the possibilities of getting rich if you come to New Amsterdam and begin to settle and build yourself, uh, create a farm and a, a prosperous life for yourself. Next slide. Next slide. Again, other earlier to be sold ads, a likely Negro wench, 27 years old, Bermuda born, that has had the smallpox and measles, with a child 11 months old to be sold for want of employment only. She is a good cook and can wash iron and sew. Uh, there are several code, coded messages in this. One, to say that she is um, being sold for want of employment is to say she's not a troublemaker. She's probably not going to run away. It's rare, it ends rare in the sense that it tells us where she was born. Uh, one of the goals that the African Burial Ground Project's research was to discover where people who were here as enslaved people, where they originated. So this for us, this was like an important ad. Uh, young women are most valuable in their 20s uh, because basically sometimes when women are in their 30s, they're considered to be old women. But young childbearing women are most valuable. And again, someone may make an exception to take 
to buy someone with an 11 month old child, particularly after they're being told that she's not a troublemaker, she's a good cook, you know, she's basically an acceptable employee because um, many people, even young women with children, are running away in New York, running to, not Canada, okay, most likely uh, upstate New York along the Hudson River Valley. Places like the Bronx, Westchester, Rockland, places that have caves and mountains are ideal for running away and being, you know, hit for years. And there's a very active underground, uh, road, uh, underground railroad uh, operatives along that entire route, leading up, to, in fact, leading up to Albany. At a private sale, and private sales were much more common than public sales. A healthy, likely Negro woman, about 13 years of age, she has had the smallpox and measles, and is very strong and handy about that should be any. Uh, but we, when we reproduce the ads, we reproduce them just as they appear in the newspaper, so any seemingly typographical errors, that's where they come from, about any sort of housework or particulars in fire and prejudice. Smallpox, measles, very, very deadly diseases in early New York. And to say that someone has had it means they are now immune, which makes them twice as valuable as any other enslaved person. And the fact that she's 13 years old also means that she can be trained according to what the buyer wants in terms of particulars uh, for you know, how, to, how to clean the house, how to do the laundry, all of those things. Again, very valuable young person. Next slide. Uh, this is not New York, but this is an auction Negro sales house from Savannah. Uh, again, people tend to think of slavery as this disorganized sort of system, but this is a very organized system where millions of people are bought and sold on a regular, everyday basis. Their agents, their operatives, um, Will Trenton, and I have to turn Will Trenton out here. Uh, you know anything about Will Trenton? He was a founder of Trenton, New Jersey. Oh, his business, was well, he was a slave trader. But when you start to investigate him, I found this out because I was invited to the house for the talk, and at that time, they had his will on the wall uh, where he was willing uh, quite a few slaves to his family members. But he was known in New York and Pennsylvania, and from the 40s, they started covering up his history and didn't want people to know what, how he had made his wealth. But he was a, quote, legitimate slave owner operating on the East Coast and no doubt brought hundreds of uh, uh, thousands of people to North America for the purpose of enslavement. Uh, next slide, please. It's a misconception that uh, people did not resist slavery. Uh, people resisted slavery while still in Africa before getting to the boats, before getting to the way stations, to be sent out to various parts of the world. Uh, the runaway ad is one of the clearest uh, documents that evidence, give evidence to the, fu to the fugitives running away. Uh, three pounds reward, and this is from 1772. Ran away on Sunday the 20th instant, meaning two weeks ago, from the subscriber, a Negro man named Manuel. He is about six feet which makes him, for that time, a, a very tall guy. Uh, pretty well set, 22 or 23 years old, speaks slow, though very good English, and is a complete hand at farming business. Had on when he went away, a white flannel jacket with leather buttons, a blue cloth over his jacket, an old wool hat, and tar towel trousers. Tis suppose he's gone to Connecticut from whence he was lately purchased, or to Long Island, where he is well acquainted, having carried I believe that Schwartz should be tarried there sometime. When he absent himself from his former master, whoever will take up said Negro and bring him to me, the subscriber in New York, or secure him in any of his majesty's jails, so that I may have him again, shall be entitled to the sum of three pounds and all reasonable charges paid by Thomas Ivers. In the note well, it's probable said Negro may have gone towards Albany as he was once back among the Indians. Uh, again, you get a real sense of this person and their, their life and their activities. Uh, Manuel, again, we're talking about a young 22-year-old man uh, who has obviously been traveling throughout the area. Uh, he's come from Connecticut and he has acquaintances 
in Long Island, and it's also suspected that he may be going back towards Albany. You will find more detail about the individual in a runaway ad because the hope is, of course, to secure him again. Uh, there's no study that's been done, or it's very difficult to know whether or not runaways are ever captured. However, when you see an ad repeated over time, that gives you some indication that they're still looking for that individual. And quite often the ads are published, you know, six months before people just give up on finding that individual again. Next slide, please. Again, running away day and night uh, is a major form of resistance, but there are other forms of resistance uh, that occur on a day-to-day -day basis that include simply, my, my kids like this form of resistance, uh, asking them to do something and they take forever to do it, okay? Uh, enslaved people were working sometimes on that same premise, pretending to be sick, breaking the equipment, um, you know, not understanding what the instructions were. These were all day-to-day -day forms of resistance. So again, when people tell you that the slaves were just sort of adapted and been happy and singing and everything, people resisted all the time. The major forms of resistance, of course, would be, and this happened also, certainly in New York, to poison the family, the cook poisoning the family, to, uh, you know, give people that you were supposed to be taking care of who was sick, make them worse, not help them to get better, uh, downright to people killing the masters. These are all forms of resistance, and of course, the large resistance in New York would be the slave revolts of 1712 and the supposed revolt of 1741. Next slide, please. Uh, there were punishments when you were caught. Uh, this person was said to be gone for several weeks and he's being held in a house uh, near City Hall. It has to be cool weather, otherwise he'd be outside. And he has to be here for at least 48 hours. And people come by to look at him. and. Other enslaved people in the area are made, forced to come by and look at him to deter them from running away. So there are many forms of uh, punishment, but a public flogging is pretty standard, as well as this display uh, of punishment after people have been recaptured. Next slide, please. Uh, this is punishment, a form of punishment uh, from Jamaica, where overseers are made to publicly uh, he may humiliate and flog the returned runaway. Next slide, please. Uh, runaways are often made to wear, particularly in southern plantations and in parts of Brazil, uh, the bells. So that basically you hear the bells all day as long as this person is working. And once you don't hear the bells, that's a kind of alarm in and of itself to let you know that Sarah may be on the run again. Uh, again, and you know, these things look, they, and they're quite heavy. Uh, this thing weighs over 25 pounds. Uh, one was one is at the Smithsonian, and some weigh more, even more than that. Uh, again, this is a form, another form of punishment for people who either, you know, resist the work or particularly for runaways. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the most common artifacts that we found is the whip. Uh, they had one on display at uh, New York Historical Society during their uh, exhibit on slavery in early New York, New York uh, and they had to sort of search all around, and some were reproduced, but this is a very common artifact of the punishment of, of enslaved people. Next slide. Again, New York has many things, despite this harsh history, to celebrate. The first African-American newspaper in the United States was published in New York City, and that was Freedom's Journal, published by these two men, the Reverend Samuel Cornish and Mr. John Russworm. Russworm is believed to be the first or the third, depending on your source, black man in the United States to receive a college degree, which he received from Boynton College in Maine. Uh, Russ Worm also <laughs> was a part of the first Back to Africa movement before Marcus Garvey was a thought in his parents' mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Russ Worm and approximately 5,000 free Africans from the northeast, uh, from Maryland north, 
uh, created what we know today as Sierra Leone. I'm sorry, Liberia. And they were supported by people who were anti-slavery as well as people who were pro-slavery in America. Supposedly everybody put money into that hat. Though the problem with that was that that money somehow never made its way to Africa. So when they got to Africa for generations, and some people say even today, they were still in conflict with local people about possession of the land. Um, West Worm becomes the superintendent of schools in, um, Sierra, in, in Liberia for a time. He also is a governor of Liberia for the last two years of his life. He and his former partner, Samuel Cornish, are ideologically split on the role of the African in America. Bruce Warren believes that there will never be such a thing as a free black man in America, and that's why he and the others go back to Africa. Cornish, on the other hand, uh, he's a local Presbyterian minister in, in Manhattan. He believes that uh, Africans in America have made a tremendous sacrifice and should stay in America and reap some of the benefits. The newspaper is uh, started the first year of the general emancipation of the slaves in New York. The first issue is published in March of 1827, and the, quote, slave, most slaves in New York are free on July 4th of 1827. So Cornish stays here. He changes the name of the newspaper from Freedom's Journal to the rights for all, to the, the colored American, because he feels he has to make a distinction between himself and the Back to Africa movement. At this point, most people, most black people in New York are referred to as Africans. But the, uh, there's a term, uh, free person of color. So some people believe that when we say colored people today, it derives from free person of color, because you know how we like to shorten things for whatever reason. And Cornish states here, he changes uh, the paper to the colored America and then the rights for all. So in total, he publishes the first three black newspapers in the United States. And they're all published out of offices on um, Church Street in Lower Manhattan, very close to the former African burial ground at this point. Next slide. Uh, July 4th, 1827, was the day that the state of New York recognized the emancipation of, of Africans. However, the African descended people themselves refused to have any association with this date because they believed this date was 4th of July, where the white people were pulling away from Britain. And because they saw no need to free the slaves in 1776 or 1783, when the war is actually over, they reject this day as a day of celebration. And you'll see at the bottom, they choose the next day, July 5th, as a day to celebrate the emancipation of the enslaved people in New York. And I'll just read the bottom one. Uh, these are celebrations from two local churches. The first, uh, the first African Baptist Society in Albany and in New York City, Mother, uh, Mother, well, now it's known as simply Mother Zion, which still operates in Harlem. My brethren and fellow citizens, I hail you all. This day we stand redeemed from bitter thraldom. Of us, it may be truly said, the last agony is over. The Africans are restored. No more shall the accursed name of slave be attached to us. No more shall Negro and slave be synonymous. And this was from a speech by the Reverend William Hamilton uh, on July 5th. There was a major uh, parade up Broadway, again, toward back in the direction of the African burial ground. Even though technically, by law, the African burial ground is not supposed to be in use then, but we found evidence that it was still in use because it seems that if someone had a relative who had died there, quite often people would bury babies sort of alongside the relative, even though it was against the law to continue to use burial ground. Uh, a, the new Negroes burial ground around Christie Street was supposed to be in use at this period. But uh, the coroner's records indicate that there were at least a dozen babies, two adult women, and seven men that were buried in the African burial ground uh, near City Hall after its use. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Frederick Douglass, the great orator, he had much to say about Fourth of July to give you some indication of, you know, what how, what other people felt about it. 
Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man to the grand aluminum, illuminated temple of liberty and call upon you to join him in joyous anthems were inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. What to the American slave is your 4th of July, I answer, a day that reveals to him more than any other day in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness a swelling vanity. Your signs of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass impotence, your shout of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all of your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast fraud, deception, and piety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up the crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, one, 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 two. Uh, New York is also the only place where any major person, any captain, was executed for the slave trade. And this is 1882, where the Link, 1862, where the Lincoln administration is trying to send a message uh, that he is very serious about the uh, ending of slavery in America. And Captain Nathaniel Gordon brings in, in 1862, a shipment of Africans that are being stored, if you will, in Montgomery, Alabama. And they stay there, there, even after the Civil War. And they wind up sort of living on the surrounding islands around uh, Montgomery. But he is executed at the tombs in New York City, and he is the only person this high up in the slave trade, in the business, uh, that is executed for any crimes whatsoever. Next slide. Uh, you may be familiar with the Civil uh, Civil War draft riots of 1863. Uh, when the war starts in 1861, it is assumed that the war will be over in a number of months. If you watch movies like uh, Coal Mountain or any of those movies, everybody's saying, you know, the war's going to be over. You know, it's, it's not a year. Nobody had any idea it would be a year. In New York, there were fathers and sons from well-to-do elite families who had been trained at West Point, who were military experts, who went to war together only to be killed, and there was nobody to replace them in the war. So the war drug on so long that in New York, the state legislature decides that they will allow rich men to substitute poor men, primarily the Irish, in coming to take their place in the war. Well, at first, this seemed like a good idea to everybody. Uh, these men were told that, oh, if you go to war for me, you'll get $750, which was a fortune, of course, at that time. Uh, again, the war drug on too long. So then people started to be told, well, and that, that amount dwindled from $750 to about $200. However, people were told, well, you go to war, and you come back, and you get the money. Imagine that. Okay, so many people, of course, didn't come back, so it became very difficult for the wives and the you know, remaining family members to collect that money. And as it seemed, people thought in 1863 that the war was coming to an end. Uh, they decided, that, and the poor white men were being told that they were going to have to compete with Africans for jobs. And that was not sort of a part, that was even further, further insult to many of them. So for several days, people burned the houses of Africans, people who were uh, anti-slavery. This is said to be Second Avenue, about 23rd Street. Uh, that's on fire here. Uh, next slide. This is 45th Street and 5th Avenue, where the Colored Orphan Asylum 
that housed more than 600 orphaned black children were set on fire uh, during this massacre as well. According to New York newspapers, uh, anywhere from 400 to 900 people were killed in this, during the Civil War draft riots. Uh, next slide, please. And this man is said to be, have been the president of the African Men's Clarkson's Association. Uh, this is Clarkson Street in Greenwich Village. And the African Clarkson's Men's Association was a group of black men that collected books for black families because black people could not, just like other places in the country, could not ride on public transportation, could not visit the public libraries in New York. So he and his um, associates collected money, bought books, and uh, loaned them to black families. And again, he's very prominent in the community, and he is lynched out of his office, coming out of his office um, during the Civil War draft riots. Just one of them. Next slide. Uh, this was a, a, a kind of car commemorating uh, the burning of the Children's Asylum. Uh, the asylum actually sort of, every, all of these activities forced Africans to evacuate Lower Manhattan to Brooklyn. Some people go to what's known today as Weeksville. Others uh, began to move up the west side in the direction of Harlem. Uh, the, um, um, Seneca Village is established around that time, again, because the further you are away from the center of the city, which is still Lower Manhattan, uh, you're, you're not considered to be as much of a threat as long as you're not in the, the core of the city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is sort of a cartoon that, uh, commemorating, in New York, there are hundreds, you know, everybody sees the movie Glory and don't realize that Many of the soldiers in the Civil War, the black soldiers, come from New York. The only officer uh, from New York is a man from Harrison, New York. And according to the Veterans Bureau, this man was illiterate and could not write, read or write. But yet, uh, his wife turned in numerous letters that he had written her after he had died in order to try to claim uh, his veterans' benefits. And I mean, he, he seemed to know everything going on in the community, including that his wife was probably having a share with several different men. So he had written about that. He'd written her love poetry. He'd written her all of this information. And they had, a, the, the wife had a daughter who was not his daughter, but her goal was to prove to the veterans that he saw her his daughter as his and that she should receive a part of his pension. And it took over 12 years, but eventually that did happen. Uh, next slide, please. Now, you are looking at, again, in 1863, and this is just before the draft rides, where black men are receiving um, honors. And this is, um, this is on 14th Street in Union Square Park. And this is a major celebration um, for you know, their accomplishments in the Civil, you know, civil War. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, slavery in New York has a long history, a long, ugly history. Again, as a burial ground, 45% of the 419 human remains that were excavated were of children under the age of 12 who had suffered from, no doubt, measles, mumps, chicken pox, things that we're immune against today. We don't know precisely what anyone from the burial ground died from. We know what they lived with in terms of disease. Uh, we know, for example, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, you're looking at the remains of four individuals here, an adult man, a five-year-old uh, male child, a woman, and in the fold of her arm, you see a dark spot, that's a newborn infant. Uh, you know, theoretically, this, these could have been family members, but uh, we don't think so because they're from different time periods in the burial ground. Um, we know that 85% of the men suffered from entheopathic lesions, uh, basically uh, damage to the neck and shoulder and the spine. And an entheopathic lesion happens when you have something on your head or your shoulders that pulls the uh, bone away, the tissue away, and the, the bone is sort of just circulating throughout your system. 85% uh, of the men suffered from this kind of illness. 
uh, 65% of the women. Uh, and according to Michael Blakey, who was our uh, physical science forensic director for the project, this means you'd have to be carrying something that weighed one to 200 pounds on your head, neck, or shoulders to cause this kind of injury. Uh, at least 60% of all the teenage boys had similar injuries. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the infamous map. This is one of the Marshak map, an insurance map that informed the General Services Administration of the United States government that they were about to build on the Negro burial ground. Now, if you think of uh, the opening shot of uh, Law and Order, and you think of the courthouse building, on the other side of that freshwater pond would be, in the future, the federal court courthouse building. And if you were standing there, you could look across in the 1600s, 1700s and see the African burial ground, approximately five and a half to six acres in size. Now, archaeologists, well, you know, the GSA got archaeologists who told them they would never find any human remains here. The area had been destroyed, it had been farmed, it had built on, been built on top of, there would be no human remains. First week out during the excavation, five human remains were found. Uh, as time went on, they had excavated more than 300 human remains with no research design. In Archaeology 101, that's rule number one. You don't excavate a site without a research design. Uh, according to a former um, city council commissioner, she said that's like going to a foreign country with no destination in mind and no understanding of the language. You have no idea what you're doing. And yet, more than 300 remains have been excavated from the site. And in fact, they were being wrapped in newspaper because, because there was no plan. Nobody had thought to get acid-free paper, which would have protected them. Some of the earliest remains I saw at the site when I came on board in 1992, in 1991, was um, I remember seeing a skull with an imprint of a black bra on it right here. And that had come from the newspaper. Uh, this you know, caused a lot of ruckus in particularly the African American community. And people were saying how disrespectful it was to excavate it. Uh, in general, but to excavate it with no plan, and the remains were then being stored in gym lockers at Lehman College in the Bronx. So uh, this resulted in a number of public hearings where the remains were eventually moved to Howard University, where they were analyzed for five and a half, well, off and on for five and a half years, because some years there was funding, other years there was no funding, some years Howard University was trying to fund the project themselves, uh, when I first came on board, the idea was that maybe, maybe $5 million would be spent on the project. Uh, and it takes about $3 million just to excavate and, and nothing else. To date, no one is sh exactly sure except possibly the uh, government office of accounting, but more than $50 million has been spent on the African burial ground. And sadly, a part of it has been just People doing the, different people doing the same thing because of the disorganization of the project. Next slide. Uh, we, there are only three headstones from, from the cemetery and none of them are readable. Uh, this is one of the, we don't know the name of anybody that is buried <coughs> in the burial ground. So in a normal excavation, you simply number everybody. So this headstone is associated with the headstone with the burial of an adult male and known just simply as burial number 18. Okay. Typically, it took one person seven to 10 days, approximately uh, seven, about eight hours a day to excavate one human remain. And that's because nothing holds these bones together. There's no tissue, there's no mushroom. But, and, you know, you basically, and you don't, she's using a paintbrush, you don't want to remove too much dirt because otherwise it's going to hamper the process of analyzing the bones. One of the things that you can analyze human remains for uh, are nutritional traits to tell what people ate when they were alive. 
which will also give you some idea of how healthy they were or how healthy they weren't. Uh, so quite literally, you know, we've all heard the expression, you are what you eat, well that's true. After you die, your, the gases from it, all the foods you sort of pass out of your body, and much of the, uh, the information is stuck in the bones. And that's what we were trying to do here, was to, certain diseases you can see on the bones, you can see tuberculosis under a microscope. So we know that a, a fair degree of people had tuberculosis, and we know that the diets, not, no surprise, in enslaved Africans were particularly poor uh, that were in, in the burial ground. Next slide. Now that, I want to say something about taking about seven to 10 days to excavate a remain. That's called the historical archeological method. It's slow, it's tedious, it's time consuming. You make drawings, you make tons of photographs, and that's, that's the way I was taught to do in, in archeology span field school. However, uh, the GSA brought on an expert at one point that said, you're wasting time. Uh, you, you know, your goal is not to excavate a cemetery, it's to put up a federal office building. So, you should use the coroner's method. Coroner has one tool. Anybody know what that is? Sure. Just scoop it up, toss it in a box, and be done with it. That resulted in the shutting down of the site for about four days because people from everywhere just came and sat down. Some people were arrested, but they had to go back to this tedious, costly method of having archaeologists working three hour shifts around the clock to get the excavation uh, completed in order to lay the foundation for the building. And in fact, that date wasn't met, and somehow remains were, according to the New York Times, accidentally destroyed on February 14th of 1992. Uh, but while those remains were destroyed, somehow the cement people were right there to put the foundation of the cement. So you, you make your own decision as to what happened there. After many years of public strife, debate, arguments with the people of the Ripple and the GSA, who refers to themselves as a federal government's landlord, they build and maintain all federal buildings everywhere on the planet that are the property of the United States government, um, from your local post office in the Pentagon to any other building in any U.S. territories. So, and they view themselves, quote, as the agents of the people of the United States. However, they run in conflict for the entire period, over 12 and a half years. I was brought on to contribute to the missing research development. And uh, I worked on that for about a year and a half. And then I was asked, and I was naive, I believe me, I was foolish and naive. I said, you know, is there something else we need besides a research design? And at that time, I was running a black history walking tour business, and I had people calling me night and day asking me for information on the burial ground. I just didn't have the resources to, to respond to them. So I said, what we need is one place that people can call for information that's not my house, okay? And they said, oh, that's a good idea. So we started a public information office, and I was told that there would only be an interest in the African burial ground for six months to one year. I was told not to make any long-range plans because people just weren't going to be that interested. Well, I laughed at the time, but it seems the last laugh was on me. Uh, people, I did this work for 12 and a half years, and to be a contract consultant to the federal government for 12 and a half years is completely unheard of. And the African burial ground became an example of how not to do historic preservation uh, because they basically had done it so badly. But in the meantime, uh, myself and a staff of 15 people, archaeologists, public educators, uh, historians, many members of this huge multinational team that was working on the project we provide information to almost one million people around the world about the African Burial Ground Project. We trained 455 volunteers. People all over the world found out about the burial ground as a result of that. Is, is all this uh, derivative of the uh, burial ground in Lower Manhattan at 290 Broadway? Yes. It is? Yes. Burial ground site which is now a national monument site, the only one in Manhattan that commemorates the African presence. 
Okay, so this is uh, Wall Street and the East River where the original slave auction house was located. These small uh, coffins were created in Ghana and they're, there's a reason that they're small. Uh, one, it would have taken probably another one to two million dollars to, to lay the remains out in the way they were laid out when they were buried. Plus, at this point, you only need the coffin to be as long as your femur, your long bone, and as deep as your skull. So, um, again, there were 419 remains, and there were 450 coffins made. Ten coffins are filled with what we call ancestor cards from people around the world, uh, letters and good wishes for the remains that were being returned to their final resting place. So about 5,000 of them were destroyed at the World Trade Center during the bombing, but we still managed before uh, the reburial ceremony to collect another seven or 8,000. And again, they came from the 50 states as well as 36 countries abroad. We had cards written in Chinese by Chinese school children that some, we had a couple of volunteers that were in the Peace Corps and they were stationed in China teaching English to, uh, to young children. And those children had sent back ancestor cards uh, to be buried with the, with the human remains during the reburial ceremony. Next slide. Okay, this is the site, uh, one of the versions of the site before the remains. Now, the, the gates that you're looking at, that's where the remains are actually buried behind. <coughs> Now, under the red soil here, there's, prob there's at least 10,000 remains that were not excavated because uh, Noel Pointer, who some of you might remember Noel, Noel was on our um, uh, committee to commemorate the burial ground, and he and others collected more than 50,000 signatures, submitted them to Congress demanding in 1993 that the General Services Administration stop excavating the burial ground and as a result that they did so that they, we could only analyze the 419 remains that had already been excavated. We were working on 10, and then the others are protected under the foundation of the now monument that's on the African burial ground. Okay, again, this was uh, celebrations leading up to, uh, to the burial ceremony that, uh, the former unhappy mayor there, um, <laughs> Jesse Jackson, four times after 9-1-1, um, after he came to the site on a monthly basis with the Rainbow Coalition uh, to s sort of have prayers and uh, spiritual ceremonies at the site. Um, Mother uh, uh, Maya Angelou was a part of the second an uh, the, uh, anniversary of the new burial ceremony. And again, uh, Six, 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 no, it was three months after the ceremony. Uh, I got a call from a reporter in the Netherlands, and he said he uh, wanted to interview me because he noticed that there was a big celebration of the historical relationship between the Dutch and the British, but no one was saying anything about the African presence during this period. And uh, here, on that particular day, Mayor Bloomberg was saying, you know, how sorry he was, and he read a letter of apology and all this. And he said, why do you think that is? I said, because people's attention span is very short. You know, uh, sadly, in this big celebration where Africans were crucial to the, the building of New Amsterdam and New York, they simply were not being recognized again. But that's a, that's a part of the history as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are several monuments in the area now. One of them uh, was created by the sculptor uh, Lorenzo Pace, who also is a professor, uh, I believe, at Brooklyn College. And this is called Spirit of Human Triumph, and it is in the center of Foley Square. And you're looking at the old federal courthouse building and a new federal courthouse building in the background there. And again, in the 1600s, 1700s, the burial ground would be foremost in the slide, and people on the other side would be looking across the collect pond at the burial ground. Next slide. This was the wedding design, which some people say 
Seems like a starship enterprise, but okay. Uh, this is a wedding design that's on the burial ground now. Again, the remains of the 10,000 or so are underneath and alongside the two buildings. That's where the 419 were reinterred. Next slide. And on uh, October 5th of 2007, the site was dedicated as a national monument. And uh, this was, I'm working on a book of uh, poetry and collage from this very hectic period in my life. And this was a poem that I've written that I dedicate to uh, President Barack Obama, African Lives in America. In spite of the deadly storms of the past, the turbulence of the Atlantic, the babies, dead and dying, parents weeping for the losses which can never be replaced, Africa lives. In spite of the atrocities of the slave auction houses throughout the diaspora, where 20 million, no, more than 20 million, men, women, and children were bought and sold as human chattel over two centuries, yet Africa lives. Grand ladies still sashay to the rhythms of the drum, to the visions of the dream, by heartbeats between mothers and children always reconnecting across space and time, Africa lives. And the prayers manifested by the ancestors in the cadence of the hip hop beat, in the projects, in the suburbs, in the tenement, and in the White House. Africa yet lives in America. Thank you very much. Woo. Sometimes you come into a halt when you get towards slavery. But I get so encouraged when people bring information like you do to show that little information about that woman in Bermuda that is documented that you can actually find your family. Mm -hmm. So it really encourages me to keep going on and keep going back. Well, you know, the signers of the Constitution, the Morris Brothers, that Morrisania in the Bronx is named for, they brought their slaves with them from Bermuda mm -hmm. here. And a few of the slaves ran away, but most of them wound up in New York, ran back to the Morris family, because the Morris uh, <coughs> brothers wanted the Bronx, the, uh, the sort of West Bronx, to become the capital of the United States. And they were on the list, okay, uh, for New York City was the original capital. And the only reason they didn't uh, sort of get the bid was because they felt that the Harlem River was too narrow for ships to come up in the same way that the East River or people would be able to come up the West Side. So they, what I learned about them was that they brought over 200 enslaved people here with them. And they farmed what was a plantation that later becomes known as Marsania in the Bronx. So, you know, everywhere, New, you know, New York City, was the center of the slave trade in the North. Ironically, the only place possibly more active, if you can believe it, was Rhode Island, where in Rhode Island, slavery sustained Rhode Island. Uh, there were two members of the US Congress who were brothers in Rhode Island, and they created what they called the perfect business plan. They built slave ships and they created insurance companies mm -hmm. so that if the slaves did not show up and you had already invested, you could be reimbursed through their, through their insurance company. Again, you know, people were no less ingenious mm -hmm. in terms of how to make money in the past than they are today. And, you know, we, we tend to forget that. And sadly, the commodity was in human beings. In Yonkers, New York, uh, there's a, a small historic house of uh, a founder of Yonkers who says that slavery was the single most prosperous endeavor he ever encountered. Because again, you're talking about buying a person, if it's a woman, having her produce as many children as possible, which also becomes your property. Because the children are not free, uh, as would say, you know, a white indentured servant. And this can go on for generations. And this did go on for generations. So when I hear people say slavery was not profitable, the only person that slavery was not profitable for was for the enslaved person. 
but for anybody else involved, that they were making money. There are people in the United States that are still spending the money that they made during slavery time. A lot of our major institutions, Yale University, is associated with the slave trade. And we need to look closely at the, the Philip Morris Corporation, oh my God, the tobacco people, entrenched for generations. Their owners, their, you know, the, their people are spending money from the slave trade today. And we need to wake up about that. Yes. Uh, along with this gentleman here, I thank you for being here today because this is valuable stuff for us. And, uh, I want to also have to give a little testimony. Um, I was a friend of Noel Pointer, and he was, I was one of the people uh, who was originally uh, kind of conscripted by him and his mother, Lavinia, yes. to uh, be a part of that uh, uh, initial group that uh, sallied into the uh, burial ground mm -hmm. situation. We did a lot before I left the situation, but it was uh, it's nice to be able to recollect most of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, um, uh, I was cognizant of the fact that um, you you mentioned Marsania. Um, in my past life, <laughs> I'm retired now. I'm, I was an Episcopal priest in uh, uh, Trinity Parish, Wall Street. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like uh, conscripted some of us to be a part of the Marsania project, mm -hmm. and that project was to look into the whole background of the Morrises as it related to Van the Van Cortlands and Van Cortland Park and all those things up in Yonkers, up one of the mm -hmm. places you were talking about. And um, the interesting thing was, I, I was, uh, like you, very naive. And um, I know why I was there, because um, I was the only black priest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew why I was put on the board, but the point is um, that I learned some very, very interesting Things. For instance, uh, um, in New York, uh, uh, slavery technically still existed in Marsania in uh, 1887 because the people who worked on their lands were still working for them under the same conditions. So the Morrises were very guilty and they tap into the Morrises in Trenton and uh, in, in, in New Jersey too. But the thing I really wanted to ask you was this. Um, wasn't it part of the uh, mindset of the government of the United States to make sure that uh, black people understood that uh, they were no longer enslaved after the Emancipation Proclamation in the in in the seceding states. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is simply that black people in those states that were like New York, New Jersey, were really not free after the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, absolutely that's true. And even in New York that July fourth, July fifth date, right. that's misleading. Because if you were a young man, you still have to give 28 years service to your former master to compensate him for the loss of a lifetime of service. And if you're, you, if you're a young woman, you have to give up to 25 years. Mm -hmm. So technically, the last slave to be freed in New York was in uh, 1844. Mm -hmm. However, you're, you're absolutely correct. We know that and this is certainly, you know, this predates Reconstruction and the end of the Civil War, we know that the conditions that black people lived under were so similar to slavery that, you know, that you certainly couldn't, couldn't tell them apart. And then new, quote, black codes were made to restrict your movement. Uh, you know, it's certainly known that even in the 30s and 40s that people, young black men, particularly who might go south to visit a relative, might be arrested and put on a chain gang, you know, no trial, no judge, and be there for a minimum of 30 days just giving free labor to, you know, some court, some state, or some individual. So, you know, we, we do know that uh, it may be 
the people in Texas were not the only people not clear that, you know, that the war was over. As a Juneteenth? Yes, or, or, you know, what it might mean for them. Because, you know, it's one thing to say something is over, but the lack of enforcement, I mean, that, that led to the Civil Rights Movement. Had there been any enforcement, there wouldn't have been a need for, for the Civil Rights Movement. But clearly, you know, it didn't happen. Yes? To be honest, I was still in slavery. The cabal of the United States, they had the whole system set up. Everybody restricts what we can do. All the laws are set up, police are set up, everybody is set to control us. All the way that we now we have chains on us and everything. We have economical uh, chains on us. Some of us are able to make it, and a lot of people are not able to make it. And the people who make it don't seem to care about the people who don't make it. You know, so we're I, all part of slavery, we're still part of slavery. I teach college, and it is so disturbing what young people think. I had a student say to me recently, she said, well, we don't sit on the back of the bus anymore. I said, but sweetie, I said, have you noticed? You're the only ones in the bus anymore. <laughs> And she was like, what? <laughs> you know, you know, and everybody else in your neighborhood, all the white people, they're driving a car. <laughs> yes, you, you own the whole bus now. So <laughs> he's proud of it, I guess. I, I was very lucky. Uh, my family goes way back to 1640. And there was, there was slaves, my, my ancestors, who were put in charge of slaves. We had one fellow who was in charge of the whole plantation. He controlled all the slaves and everything. I have a picture from my great-great-grandmother from Sierra Leone. I was not able to trace her back to Sierra Leone. But I have slave records for Will, slave and Will. And I, you mentioned about the Civil War. My great-great-grandfather fought in the Civil War, and I have all his armor records. But you got to be lucky. you got to be able to get this stuff. so rare because most of us can't you know, can't look back at all because clearly one of the goals was to disrupt black families. To, you know, I mean, if you just look at the census records, you can look at thousands of census records and it will be, it'll say Mary, head of the household of seven. You don't even know Mary's last name, which makes it impossible for Mary's descendants to do any real genealogy. And that's, that's the majority of the cases. It's a rare situation when you even see a last name. Again, thank you all for having me. Thank you so much. Okay. New Year's spirit can help you to find something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you so much for coming again. It's been a wonderful presentation. And um, I'm just so glad that we have so many folks that did come out today in the rain. I know it was really rough. Um, and I just want to thank you all because, I mean, just listen to the conversation that, that followed the presentation. We have a, a people here who, who can experience things and tell us about it and we can learn from them as well. We need to really come together. We were talking about Liberia earlier and we just found out last week we've been researching this mural over here and we found that it was carved in Liberia. We always knew that it was carved by one African man or one African tree because the person who donated it told us that. But she didn't know much about it because her husband had purchased it. And after 50 years laying in that basement floor unopened, he passed away and she donated it to the museum. But she didn't know where it came from or anything. But we found a similar one. <clears throat> Our little art therapist and director, Fatima White, did some research. And she found one similar, the same stippling at the bottom, and found out that this one too had come from uh, the same artist. And she's working on getting his name now because she's contacting the museum that holds the other mural that is like this uh, to find out who the artist is. But it's all coming. I mean, every time we come in, there are coincidences, you know. <laughs> every time we come in, they just want to meet and greet educators, teachers, librarians, um, everybody, folks, just folks. But principally, they are trying to make connections because they have never been invited to Nassau County. They've been to almost all of the high schools in Suffolk. And when they go to talk to the children to the school, at the schools, they talk to them about their, 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 how they live, their culture. And they also teach them. They play music and they teach them how to make jewelry and things like that. But no school in, in Nassau County has ever invited them. They come every year. They've been to Mel, uh, what's it, Ward Melville High School out in out East Sunday. Then all the schools in, in, in uh, Suffolk County. But they will be here on the 22nd. Uh, and it's just a meet and greet. They want to uh, 
meet with folks from Nassau County who can invite them back. Because we were only on the schedule because I heard about them and I called them, these just can you come to the museum? And they said, we didn't even know there was a museum. So yes, we'll be there. You know, so, I mean, but we, we could, if we could bring them back on a regular basis, like every, all the other